In the middle of 1942, the Allied navies in the Atlantic were facing a dire situation. For the last six months, German U-boats had unleashed a devastating wave of sinkings along the American East Coast, pushing Allied shipping losses in the Atlantic to record levels. But over the next 12 months, in a colossal effort, the American and Royal Navies turned the campaign around, culminating in a series of colossal convoy battles that crushed the U-boat force, secured control of the Atlantic, and paved the way for Allied victory in World War II. Nineteen forty two was a bad year for the Allies in the Atlantic. German U boats had rampaged like never before, and more than five point four million tons of Allied shipping was sunk in the North Atlantic alone. It was especially bad off the eastern seaboard of the United States, where American ships were subject to an onslaught following their entry into the war in the dying days of nineteen forty one. Whereas the British had learned the hard way the value of keeping merchant ships together in close formation, escorted by anti-submarine escorts, it was a lesson which the US Navy under Admiral Ernest King had not yet fully taken on board, and it was slow to provide sufficient escorts or an organised convoy system. This meant there were hundreds of lone, unescorted merchant ships scattered up and down the coast at any one time, making it almost trivial for German U-boats to attack. Between January and June 1942, 360 Allied merchant ships were sent to the bottom in this part of the Atlantic by enemy submarines. Of these, just 11 were sailing in convoy at the time they were sunk. During this time, the bulk of the US Navy's resources in both aviation and escort vessels remained in the Pacific, and it took until July after a six-month massacre on the East Coast for the intervention of President Roosevelt to force Admiral King to divert resources to put Atlantic traffic in convoy. After this, losses plummeted. Three ships were sunk in this region in July and none thereafter for the rest of 1942. Instead, the U-boats shifted their focus back to the Mid-Atlantic, plying their deadly trade again in the gap between air cover from east and west. But as they did so, Dönitz's U-boats found their opponents had greatly strengthened. During the six months when German focus was on the American coast, the Royal Navy had quietly built up its strength. Dozens of new flower-class corvettes had entered service on top of the 118 commissioned in 1941, and many escorts had been refitted with more advanced radar and weaponry like the Hedgehog anti-submarine mortar. In the air, it was a similar story. RAF Coastal Command strength rose from 28 aircraft in July 1942 to 118 by the start of 1943, with new, very long-range B-24s being delivered, possessing advanced radar and weaponry to find and sink U-boats. As well as possessing more and better weaponry, the coordination between air and sea assets had improved dramatically by late 1942, and as more and more Liberty ships came into service, so did the average speed of Allied convoys. The result of all of this was that convoy ships became tougher to catch and tougher to attack, and the number of ships proceeding independently, which had been the U-boat's main targets thus far, fell off a cliff. In August 1942, the number of ships sunk in convoy exceeded that of those sunk unescorted for the first time, simply because there were almost none of the latter left in the key battleground of the North Atlantic. The efforts of three Allied navies had squeezed the space for the U-boats to operate in and removed the supply of easy prey. If the U-boats wanted to do serious damage to Allied trade in 1943, they would have to do so by attacking convoys head-on. It was a challenge the cruiser arena was prepared to meet, with the largest fleet of U-boats yet. By the start of 1943, they had 212 submarines operational, and in March 1943 made their first large-scale convoy attack of the year. 41 U-boats were deployed in three wolf packs to intercept the convoys HX-229 and SC-122 as they crossed the Mid-Atlantic Gap, totaling 110 merchant ships between them. Over three days and nights, a titanic battle took place in which 22 Allied merchant ships were sunk for the loss of just one U-boat. It was a striking German success and raised the terrifying prospect in London that perhaps the German Navy was now strong enough 
to make convoy ineffective, which if true could destabilize the entire war effort. But in truth, the fears were a little overblown. Even after the highest monthly losses of the entire war, 96% of those that travelled in convoy in the first three months of 1943 arrived safely at their destination. And the size of the U-boat force that had been committed to this battle was not something the Kreese Marina could keep up constantly. Large numbers of boats now had to return to port to rest and rearm, and it took until the end of April for Admiral Dönitz to deploy a large force for a second attempt at severing the Atlantic link with 50 boats launched against convoy ONS-5. This time though, the U-boats would not get off so lightly. ONS-5 was repeatedly attacked from April 29th to the 6th of May, losing 12 of its 43 merchant ships in the process. But its escort, under the leadership of 30-year-old commander Peter Gretton, struck back hard, sinking seven U-boats and seriously damaging seven others. It was a masterclass in convoy defence, utilising all of the Allied technological advances in the shape of direction finding and radar, as well as hundreds of hours spent relentlessly practising tactics and coordination between escorting ships. The reality was, for all the apparent success of March 1943, by that year the Atlantic had become a lethal environment for U-boats, who were caught between powerful convoy escorts and virtually omnipresent Allied air power across almost the entire ocean. By the end of what became known as Black May, 43 U-boats had been sunk and 73 more damaged. Though they had inflicted casualties on the Allies, the losses were totally disproportionate. More U-boats had been sunk in one month than in the entirety of 1941, at a rate three times higher than any other month on record. It was a disaster for Dönitz's fleet. Black May is often presented as the turning point in the Battle of the Atlantic, but really it was the end of it. Faced with such colossal losses, Dönitz had no choice but to pull his boats back from further direct attacks on Allied convoys after May 1943. But the brutal reality was that if they couldn't attack convoys, then the U-boat arm no longer had any way of impacting Allied merchant shipping. This was immediately borne out in the statistics. Shipping losses plummeted to just 30,000 tonnes in June 1943, and after a brief increase the following month, never again rose to even early war levels. Indeed, the tables were soon turned completely, with U-boats becoming the prey of new Allied hunter-killer groups of escort carriers and destroyers. Harried and hunted by Allied air and sea assets almost from the moment they left port, Dernitz's boats were unable to meaningfully affect Allied shipping, and began to suffer devastating losses even without large-scale battles. In the last two years of fighting from the start of May 1943, 562 U-boats were sunk. It was a crushing and total Allied victory. It was a victory not won in May 1943, but over the course of four years preceding it, by shipyard workers, codebreakers, naval planners, scientists and engineers, and the merchant and military sailors of dozens of nations, including all the major powers. The dramatic events of Black May did not decide the Battle of the Atlantic, but they revealed who had already won it, through industrial and technological might. But it was a victory won at a huge material and human cost. By the middle of 1944, 20 million tonnes of Allied shipping had been sunk, 16 million of it in the waters of the Atlantic. More than 46,000 civilian merchant sailors had died on the Allied side, at a casualty rate that was much higher than those in the armed navies. It was even worse on the Axis side. The 762 total U-boats lost during the war had taken with them 28,000 men, a casualty rate of 75%, which was the highest of any branch of any armed service anywhere in the world during World War II. Victory in the Atlantic in 1943 did not involve the destruction of a German army group as Stalingrad did, or liberate vast swathes of territory as was happening then in North Africa and Italy, but it laid the logistical foundation for the enormous Allied advances yet to come. Control of the Atlantic allowed the unhindered transport of American troops and material for the largest amphibious invasion in history in June 1944, and it enabled the shipments of huge amounts of Lend-Lease support to the Soviet Union. This included hundreds of thousands of trucks, as well as the high-octane aviation fuel and aluminium critical for aircraft production, of which the Soviets had very little 
This support played a key role in the transformation of the Red Army into an offensive mobile force capable of sweeping through Eastern Europe in 1944 and 1945. Allied victory in World War II, when it eventually came, was built on a foundation laid in the Atlantic over four years of fighting. <laughs> 